وكذلك أوحينا إليك روحا من أمرنا ما كنت تدري ما الكتاب ولا الإيمان ولكن جعلناه نورا ولكن جعلناه نورا نهدي به من نشاء من عبادنا وإنك لتهدي إلى صراط مستقيم صراط الله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض ألا إلى الله تصير الأمور الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بالسنة إلى يوم الدين All praise due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on his last Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. We welcome you dear viewers to another in our series in the names of Allah. And in this series we are looking at Allah's most beautiful names. Not merely to know them as names but more importantly to understand their meaning so that they can take a special place in our lives from the perspective of worshiping Allah through those names as he said walillahi al-asma'ul husna fad'uhu biha all the beautiful names belong to Allah so call on him with them pray to him through them on one perspective we would turn to Allah through his names and on the other perspective where the names have relevance in our lives we would seek to implement them in our daily lives so this is the goal of the program in this episode we are looking at the 12th name al jabbar the compeller and this name is mentioned only once in the Quran and that is in Surah Al-Hashr where Allah says there Al-Mu'min Al-Muhaymin Al-Aziz Al-Jabbar the grantor of security the guardian the mighty the compeller now the meaning of this name of Allah this divine name Al-Jabbar is derived from the root of the term Jabbar where this name came from and that is Jabr Jabr basically means to force someone or some something to to do something to someone or to oneself as Allah told Prophet uh, Muhammad sallallahu regarding his people's rejection of his message وَمَا أَنْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ Bijabbar that's in Surah Qaf verse 45 you are not there to compel them Allah informs the Prophet ﷺ that he can't force people to accept the message his job was only to convey that message the other meaning of Jabr is to mend a broken bone or to save someone from poverty the word Jabbar also means arrogant and proud as in the verse where Allah has Jesus speak or he quotes Jesus' speech as a child when people questioned his mother about this child when she was not married and he said وَلَمْ يَجْعَلْنِي جَبَّارًا شَقِيًّا he did not make me arrogant and wretched relative to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this name means the one who mends who mends and corrects the affairs of his creatures he mends their hearts as well as the one who compels his creatures to do what is in their best interests 
With regards to the effect of this these, uh, belief in these names, first and foremost, belief that Allah is the ultimate compeller who has created certain characteristics in human beings and in his creation, which one cannot change, one has to accept as is, beyond his or her control. This should encourage or uh, show the way for the believer to be more tolerant and accepting of his or her circumstance, and not to fight and to struggle, especially in those areas which are beyond his or her control. But instead, one seeks refuge in Allah from those areas. We seek Allah to protect us from those things which have been, uh, which are evil, for example, is in them, but it is set, it is fixed, and it is beyond our control to deal with it. So, for example, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had told us that when we get married, then we should say, Allahumma inni as'aluka khayraha, in relationship to our wives, wa khayra ma jabaltaha alayhi. وَعَوْذُ بِكَ مِنْ شَرِّهَا وَمِنْ شَرِّ مَا جَبَلْتَهَا عَلَيْهِ O Allah, I ask you for the good which is within her and the good that you have created as an innate part of her character. And I seek refuge in you from the evil that is within her and the evil which is a part of her innate character. And Prophet ﷺ had told us, additional to that, that the woman is like the bent rib. That you have to accept her, you know, as she is, to a certain degree. You try to work around the fact that she is from that bent rib. You try to straighten it, you try to force it, it will break. So, that is a general principle that uh, as a believer, knowing and reflecting on this name, Al-Jabbar, it should create in us that sense of acceptance. There are other areas, of course, in our lives where there are factors and forces which are beyond our control. So we take the same approach. We ask Allah's help in those areas and ask Him to protect us. But, you know, we don't, uh, when we find ourselves unable to make a change or unable to... Uh, you know, get out of those circumstances, what do we do? We don't become frustrated and uh, end up uh, doing things that Islamically are not acceptable, but we are patient. So knowledge of this attribute helps to develop in the believer a certain level of patience. Belief in the divine name also encourages the believer to recognize his or her responsibility in the choices of life. That though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the compeller, meaning that He compels us to do certain things, all of the things that He compels us to do are good. Whatever Allah has made a compulsion in our life, it is a compulsion for good. We can't use the fact that Allah is Al-Jabbar, as a means of excusing our decisions to say things that we have chosen to do, etc. It's not really our fault. Allah has forced us to do it. Because human choice is well established. This is not something that uh, we can escape or use uh, other arguments to try to get around. Because, for example, in Surah Al-Kahf, we have Allah saying there very clearly, وَقُلِ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ Say the truth is from your Lord. Whoever wishes to believe, let him believe. And whoever wishes to disbelieve, let him disbelieve. So, every soul has the right to choose the way they want to go in this life. In spite of the fact that Allah is a Jabbar, He is not forcing us in terms of our choices. In fact, 
the area, one of the examples of the area in which areas which he has compelled us is he has compelled us to know what is right and what is wrong, to have that knowledge within our souls. As he said in Surah Ash-Shams, verses 7 and 8, وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا By the soul and who created it and inspired it to corruption and piety. So every soul is forced to know what is corruption and what is piety. So that they are able to make the choice. Because if a person doesn't know, if there isn't anything within oneself to be able to determine what is right and wrong, then how can we be judged? How can Allah then hold us accountable? So He, as Al-Jabbar, has forced each and every one of us to know the righteousness, what is righteousness, and what is corruption. And that way, we have a legitimate choice, and we are held accountable for that choice. At the same time, if Allah had willed, He could have forced everyone to believe. And that's a good thing. We could say that's a good thing. Why didn't He do that? Just as the angels all believe and are obedient, He could have done that. As He said in Surah Ra'd, verse 31, لَوْ يَشَاءُ اللَّهُ لَهَدَ النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا If Allah had wished, He would have guided all of humankind. He could have done that. However, when he created human beings, he created beings who are different from the angels. He wanted something else. He wanted creatures who would have to choose whether to be good, righteous, and to obey, or whether not to. So that was Allah's decision. So, in spite of that, uh, we can only say that human beings choose their own way. In spite of the fact that Allah is Al-Jabbar, we cannot say that we have no choice in the matter. There were people who said that a long time ago, back in the 8th century. The first person to have said it, his name was Ja'ad ibn Dirham. And he was followed by Jahm ibn Safwan in this idea, promoting the idea that human beings have no choice. After the break, we're going to come back and look at this point a little more deeply because there is someone today among Muslims who is promoting this same idea under a new guise. With that, dear viewers, I bid you farewell until we come back from the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. When you are weak and the road seems long, remember, just remember, seek strength from the strong. And people need each other's, need scholars more than they need to drink and eat. Because even regarding what we drink and eat, we may not be able to figure out which is permissible and which is not. Quran is not preserved in the books only. The seer of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam is not preserved in the books only, but in the, heart, in the hearts of men in the hearts of people who have devoted their time to seeking knowledge. Belief and trust tawakkal, that none could take place without the knowledge of Allah. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. All praise due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. We welcome you back, dear viewers, to our series, In the Names of Allah. And in the beginning of this series, uh, we looked at uh, the name Allah, 
the personal name of God, the greatest name of Allah, along with a series of other names. And we are now on the, the twelfth of the names of Allah. We started this particular episode with Al-Jabbar. And prior to the break, we are talking about the idea that Allah has forced us to do whatever we do. That we don't have any choice in the matter. That we are like puppets without any real choice. The choice is only uh, something which we imagine. It appears that way to us, but in fact we have no choice. I mentioned that an individual way back in the 8th century, the 8th century of the Common Era, claimed this. The Muslim ruler at the time executed him. He refused to recant from these beliefs because it led him to deny Allah's attributes, etc., and he was executed. But his ideas continued to spread through one of his students, Jahm ibn Safwan. And um, those ideas are now being revived by a popular writer by the name of Harun Yahya. He, in his writings under the heading of a very different approach to matter, tries to promote the idea that we don't do anything. Taking a verse from the Quran where Allah said, for example, وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى That you didn't throw when you threw, but Allah threw. That this was his explanation that Allah is doing everything. And of course, there's the verse from Surah Safat 96 where Allah says, وَاللَّهُ خَلَقَكُمْ وَمَا تَعْمَلُونَ Allah created you in what you do. So he said, we're not doing anything. Everything is being done by Allah. It is only an illusion in our minds. However, scholars of the past dealt with this idea. They show that it is false. And what it does is it will ascribe to Allah injustice. Because if Allah is the one doing everything, then it means Allah is doing sin. And He's punishing those people for the sin which He did through them, etc., and this is confusion. It's unacceptable. So this idea one has to be careful of, this individual who's trying to promote it, it is incorrect. He has gone off the track in this uh, matter. So matter is real. It is a part of Allah's creation. And the actions that we do are real. And that's why Allah ascribes them to us. If they were his actions, he would ascribe them to himself. When he spoke and said that you didn't throw when you threw, but Allah threw, is in reference to Prophet Muhammad wasallam. Before the battle of Badr, when he picked up some dust and he threw it towards the enemy, the Quraysh, who were on the other side of the valley, and the Quraysh later said that they felt dust in their face, in their eyes, without seeing any dust cloud. Obviously, the Prophet Muhammad was not the one who actually carried that dust to their eyes. Allah is the one who carried it. But the throwing actually was the Prophet Muhammad throwing. But it became miraculous. So Allah said, you didn't throw and you threw, but Allah threw. This is not uh, to be taken as a general rule for everything that we do. No. What we do is our own actions. Of course, we do it by the permission of Allah. If we want to do something, we have made a choice and we choose to do something, Allah still has to create the circumstances for us to be able to do it. Otherwise, we can't do it. So it is from that perspective that Allah says that He created us in what we do. That the circumstances for, the, for them to be there, for them to be uh, prepared for us to be able to act on our cho choices, then... Allah has to create them. If He doesn't create those circumstances, then you can't do it. And this is something real. We experience ourselves. There are times when we make plans, we seek to do certain things, and we can't do it. There are some times when we seek to do it, and we can. So who determines? This is not our determination. There obviously is something beyond us, which determines whether we are able to implement our choices or not. And that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And He is the true creator. Because if... 
it was that we, in fact, for those people who go to the other extreme and say, well, we have free will and we can do anything we want to do, you know, um, you are the controller of your future, you know, you decide what is going to happen in the future, then you become a creator yourself because you're creating circumstances for yourself. And that's not true. We're not able to create those circumstances. We do have people around today, motivators, you know, motivating speakers, who make this kind of claim. And unfortunately, even some Muslims say this also, that, uh, you know, we can create, we are, we are the masters of our own destiny. No, we're not. Allah is the master of our destiny. You know, that's a false claim. But particularly this idea, as I said, that we are not responsible for what we do, this is not true. We are responsible, and that's why there is a judgment, that's why there is heaven and hell. You know, if there was no responsibility on our part, then it would all be unfair. And Allah says very clearly in the Quran, وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدَ And your Lord is not unjust to anyone. The third point, which could be reflected on with regards to this name, Al-Jabbar, is that it should give the believer an understanding knowing that it is something unique to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when we transfer this characteristic to human beings, it becomes an evil characteristic. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be the compeller, ultimately compelling, that's fine because He only compels us to good. But for human beings now to become compellers, where they are going to compel people to do this and to do that, then we have a danger as people tend to abuse this. They become tyrants. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَاسْتَفْتَحُوا وَخَابَ كُلُّ جَبَّارٍ عَنِيدٍ They sought victory, but the hopes of every arrogant tyrant will be dashed. And the Prophet ﷺ had said, describing a circumstance on the Day of Judgment, that a neck of fire will protrude from the hellfire on the Day of Judgment, having two eyes which can see, two ears with which it will hear, and a tongue with which it will speak. It will say, I have been entrusted with three, every obstinate tyrant, everyone who claimed other gods beside me, and the picture makers. So the very first category was the obstinate tyrants. Al-Jabbarin. So this is not a characteristic that we seek to apply to ourselves. But in this case it's a characteristic that we seek to avoid. We recognize it in its perfection for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we worship Him knowing that. But Relative to ourselves, we don't try to apply it because it is a characteristic which in fact we should avoid. Prophet Muhammad used to use this name or elements of this name in dua. So we pray by using the name uh, Ibn Abbas related that between the two prostrations, the Prophet used to say, Rabbi ghfirli warhamni wajburni warzukni Warfa'ani. O my Lord, forgive me, have mercy on me, mend me, provide for me, and elevate me. So, this is the way by which we can use it in prayer. There is also another uh, dua or supplication which the Prophet ﷺ taught using an element of the name uh, for the night prayer. Uh, as Auf ibn Malik had related that he had gotten up for night prayer with the Prophet Sallallahu and the Prophet Sallallahu during his bowing while bowing in the night prayer he had said Subhana dhil jabarut wal malakut wal kibriya wal azama Glory be to the owner of majesty dominion pride and supremacy So this term, Jabarut, which is specific to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is a source of 
majesty with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Relative to human beings, it is something which they cannot take on. And as we said in the very beginning, that this quality of being the compeller is something unique to Allah and the rest of the creation, it is forbidden to them. It is a source of evil. It is a product of uh, disobedience because all of those who act in a way which forces people to do what is evil, naturally, there are people who Allah has given power and they have abused that power. So, this quality, as we said, is one which we would seek to avoid. So, in summing up, going back to the understanding of this name, we said that, first and foremost, the understanding of this name should compel the believer to accept certain things in his life, in the world around him, which he is or she is unable to change. Allah has created things in that way. What he is expected to do in such a circumstance is to seek Allah's mercy through his protection from the harm that is there and we seek to have patience to deal with those circumstances. The other point was that uh, we should know that in spite of Allah being the compeller, we are not compelled to do evil. He does not compel us to do evil. So we cannot blame Him for anything. He only compels us to do good. So we are responsible for our own actions. And finally, uh, we should also understand that we, as human beings, should avoid this name totally for ourselves and what it implies. With that, dear viewers, I'd like to thank you for being with us in this segment of our program, In the Names of Allah, and we hope that you will continue to follow the program throughout its various episodes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. When you are weak and the road seems long, remember, just remember, seek strength from the strong.